The 3.30 p.m. meeting of the Bakersfield City Council is now in session. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to call to order the 3.30 City Council meeting of March 17th, 2021. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Council Member Weir. Sorry, Vice Mayor Weir. Council Members Arias. Here. Gonzalez. Smith. I'm here. Freeman. Here. Gray. Here. And Parlier. Here. Thank you. On March 4th, Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency in California due to the threat of COVID-19. The governor also passed several executive orders, including the suspension of some components of the Brown Act related to public meetings such as this. Therefore, seating in this chambers is limited. Madam City Clerk, next item, please. Public statements. This meeting has limited public access. Therefore, public comments were encouraged to be made to the city clerk through email or by phone call. If you're here in person to make a public statement, please fill out a speaker card and give it to the city clerk. All statements are given a three-minute time limit, 15 minutes per topic. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the clerk who will give copies to the council. If you're here to speak on a workshop item, we ask that you speak after staff's presentation on that matter. We're very interested and concerned with your issues. However, due to the public notice requirement of the Brown Act, council can't take action when an item is on the agenda. The council can, however, refer your matter to committee or request that staff contact you. Please avoid any behavior that disrupts the meeting, such as repetitive statements, going off topic, shouting, surpassing the three-minute time limit. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers? Mayor Go, we've received four public speaker cards, two regarding a single subject and two regarding separate subjects. Thank you, would you please call the first? The first speaker this evening is Dustin Combs. Can we have somebody uh, help Mr. Combs, please? Should I go closer to the mic? Yes, we wanna get you uh, closer to the mic and I'm sure we can get somebody to help you. Anthony? Welcome, Mr. Combs. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Dustin Combs. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Bakersfield, and uh, I'm here today to talk about um, proposed changes in the bus routes for um, the Golden Empire Transit System and how they may affect me and my fellow disabled um, residents. It, it concerns me that um, the hours may be cut to the same hours that we have been using because of COVID. I understand the public health issue and I fully support that measure. However, it has been told to me or suggested, I'm not sure, that that may be permanent. Those changes in route times may be permanent. And um, that is that will make life very difficult for me and my fellow um, disabled uh, residents of Bakersfield and it does concern me and I'm also here to talk about the impact it could have on future generations. I mean, I'm talking about future taxpayers, future voters, you know, we want to go around town as much as everyone else and um, there are signs around town that say keep downtown open, but if, the, if, we're, um, if access to public transit is cut off to us, then we are not able to get around town. Therefore, we are not able to um, contribute economically because we won't be able to spend on goods and services in town and that will impact our fellow residents. Um, also, it could impact future generations of uh, taxpayers and consumers. And so basically what I wanna say is 
I, I want those hours for the public transit, I, I want them extended to what they used to be before COVID, and I, I want it kept that way because, you know, we want to enjoy, enjoy uh, downtown just like everyone else to the fullest extent of our ability. Um, and uh, that's, that's my statement. Thank you, Mr. Combs. Next speaker, uh, Tanner Thompson. Mr. Thompson asked that I help read his uh, public comment to you so everyone can understand what he's saying. Thank you, and welcome, Mr. Thompson. <coughs> Thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of former mayor candidate Tam Tanner Thompson, who is advocating for the disabled community. And Mayor Go, what have you done for your disabled constituents? Why are you ignoring the demands of the public transit system for regular business? You are cam you are campaigning to keep your city open and not worrying with the public transit services available. Thompson had over a thousand votes for his ADA platform. And if you ignore the public transit demands, we will campaign against you in the next election. Additionally, mayor and council, you have stated you do not have control over the get bus board. And that is not true. You appoint two of the five members. This allows you some control. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Michael Turnipseed. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Members, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I'm Michael Turnipseed. I represent the Kern County Taxpayers Association. I'm going to talk about a myriad of comments in, my ne in the next three minutes. Uh, first of all, I really want to unveil, since we're getting into budget season, uh, our spending priority recommendations for Measure N for 2021-22 and buckets of money that we think need to have appropriate funding on different projects. And just laying this out so you could see this, I've been having conversations with Mr. Clegg about this for the last two months. And it's time to just go public with what we're thinking. Uh, next, we've had a couple of different uh, editorial pieces, community voices in the California this last week. One concerning Old Town Kern and its revitalization. And the issue that no one seems to know about is the high speed rail viaduct running right up Sumner Avenue. So we wanted to bring that aspect up for discussion before the city starts spending money to revitalize and help Old Town Kern, we better address the most significant problem it's going to face. And that's going to be the, uh, the unintended consequences of building a 75 foot high viaduct. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about TCC. There was a meeting last week. And after the meeting, a few of us got together and reviewed the tape together because we felt that there were some misrepresentations of fact presented. So I have accumulated a, a notice here to you with what was said from the tape, quoted from the tape, and what we think the actual statement should have been. And they were fairly sizable. And next we get back to a picture of the, an article from the Californian of November 4th, 2015 showing the lines as they were drawn. And we've come to the conclusion that they, the staff continued to say that high speed rail, this is their idea of F Street. We all know the city sued high speed rail to locate the, the station on F Street. And when the final EIR came back, it was not an EIR accepted all the way to Oswald. 
there is, it was only accepted to the F Street station in the final remnants of the federal government approval. So now we're working on the, the piece from Oswell to Pal Palmdale, which we're commenting on now, and there are no comments or anything about that gap, that five mile gap, whatever it is, from F Street and how that's going to be handled and mitigated so the community doesn't have to suffer through 75 foot viaducts when the next tallest building around is going to be 33 stories. And I have one second left. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Turnip. Thank you, Mr. Turnipseek. Next speaker, please. Riddhi Patel. Hi, my name is Riddhi Patel. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've called almost all of you idiots and failures. And while that may be true in terms of failures, I will say that one, I don't think it's that you are choosing to be, or that you're um, just ignorant, you're willfully ignorant on um, what this community so desperately wants, and that you make the active decision every day to act against this community's best wishes. And also solidarity to Wheels for Bakersfield in terms of you guys do have the power to institute change and change public transit hour lines if you really wanted to. You guys just don't want to do anything. Furthermore, there are a multitude of statewide bills that support economic justice, racial justice, health justice, environmental justice, housing justice, and more. Since you guys choose to be willfully ignorant, I will usually this will be the beginning of a series where I refuse to acknowledge that you guys will actually do anything in terms of the benefit of this community. In terms of, if you do want to, I will gladly accept that help. The community would gladly accept that help. And my policy is no permanent friends, no permanent enemies when it comes to elected officials. In that, I do want to highlight the state bill, AB 1400, which would provide a single payer system for Californians. Um, Eric Arias, you have my phone number if you'd like to ever motion for the city council to pass this resolution. You're more than welcome to. I will now read this resolution. Whereas every person in Bakersfield, California deserves high quality health care, and whereas the number of Americans without health insurance before the COVID pandemic was still nearly 30 million with more than 40 million Americans underinsured, and the number of Californians without health insurance was 2.7 million with 12 million Californians under, underinsured despite important gains made since the implementation of other health care acts. Whereas the current COVID-19 pandemic has led to record levels of unemployment, loss of employer-sponsored health insurance, a severely strained healthcare system, widespread illness, and has taken a profound toll on our community's mental health, all of which is placing significant demands on our healthcare system. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic further exposed the dangerous of our fragmented, profit-driven healthcare system, which leads many Californians to delay seeking needed health care due to an inability to pay, leading to a sicker and poorer population in the long run, whereas such a population is significantly more likely to develop serious illness if exposed to diseases like COVID-19 and will subsequently face higher mortality rates. I will continue this resolution at the 515 meeting. If you guys want to pass it, a majority of Californians support it. Do your f***ing job. Thank you, Ms. Patel. Are there any other speakers? Do you have a yellow card that you can submit? Natalie Green. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate your time and generosity for listening to me today. I understand your plans are 
completely overfilled with taking care of the city during a pandemic. My hope is that we can join together in providing safety for our community. My name is Natalie Green. I am a resident, small business owner, local community stakeholder, but most importantly, a mom to a four, eight-year-old, and 11-year-old. And we do all of this in our community of Westchester. We are neighbors in a community who loves our walkability of our streets, our family bike rides, our avid dog walkers, and our historical homes. People live here for generations for their families. Our community is one of those that's very iconic, and people live here for our beautiful tree-lined streets and architecturally significant homes rooted in Bakersfield's history. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a city planner. I'm not even good at driving. I actually got lost here, for the record. That's why I was late. Sorry about that. And I don't live very far, which is also kind of not great. Um, but kind of my point, if you drive down 24th Street, you'll see that it's not an easy drive, as in you can crash into a neighborhood right into the cul-de-sacs. You can go through this big gap on C Street that then leads to this dangerous S-curve that can then catapult you into a front yard. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. With one minor distraction, it is very easy to do this. And it's not a questionable scenario. It's not, is it possible? These are real situations and situations that have already happened and tragically already ended in death. It is not a case of if, when, but when again. If the cul-de-sacs along 24th Street have had cars that have flipped in to Myrtle Street, Pine Street, and even Spruce Street, and a car that wrapped itself around the gap on C Street with a little hole that is made for walkability, which is fairly too large, is ended with a car that's gone completely in between. Um, Oop, lost my spot. And the S curve, what actually happened is a car used it as a ramp and went right into a neighborhood where there's not one but two neighbors that have trampolines in their front yard that when it's warm, kids are out there jumping on the trampoline and ended with a car in their front yard. It's not safe. It's not a, it's not a question of when these accidents are going to occur. It is how often who is it going to hit? Who is it going to hurt? Uh, my 11-year-old son, Finn, asked, Mom, how is this safe? I want to know, too, how is it safe for toddlers, kids on bikes, dogs on leashes, being right next to a six-lane highway? It's not. I mean, one toddler's decision to let go of a parent's hand from their front yard can run out and get hit by a car. We need to make it safe, and we need to make it preventable, because now's our chance to do it. We've already lost a life. We've already had multiple accidents. And as we're at the point now to where I've got to talk fast, so please make these changes. Please make a temporary small wall until you can make a really bar large wall to keep people from getting hit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Green. Uh, here. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Green, for uh, coming down today and, and sharing your statement. Um, colleagues, this, this uh, sentiment is widespread throughout the Westchester neighborhood uh, from many meetings that I've had with, with other residents. And I'd like to make a referral tonight to, to uh, city staff that in addition to the decorative walls that we're currently planning uh, for in the Westchester's, um, in the south side of the 24th Street corridor, that we also look at an additional wall at the S curve um, to help um, prevent what, uh, what happened just a few months ago uh, with the car landing in, in someone's front yard. Um, and then that we also please look at some other measures to reduce the speed. The other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, we saw, we learned that uh, Bakersfield was ranked number two in, uh, in pedestrian uh, uh, fatalities and one of the most dangerous cities. Um, in a report called Dangerous by Design. And I want to ask staff to provide an update to the council on the traffic calming toolkit that I referred to staff um, over a year ago. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Next item, please. Workshops item A, presentation from Golden Empire Transit. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. We have asked uh, the Executive Director, Karen King, to provide a presentation at the request of City Council. I believe there's a slide um, deck to pull up. Thank you. Welcome, Mrs. King. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. I'm here this afternoon to uh, try and help you understand 
in part, why these gentlemen have been coming to your meetings and what's going on at Golden Empire Transit District to have prompted that. Uh, next slide, please. To talk about the present and the future, I have to talk a little bit about the past. The graph on this slide shows you a green line, which is the fiscal year ending June 2019, our last normal year. And the blue line is uh, our ridership last year for the fiscal year ending in June 2020. And you'll notice that in April, March, April, there is a steep decline in ridership, which carries over to the yellow line, which is the ridership during the past year. In the year of COVID, GET has experienced a 70% decline in ridership on its buses. And with that, we've experienced a commensurate loss of revenue, both fare box revenue and tax revenue from sales tax and gas tax, which are our two main subsidies. So uh, last year, we implemented a reduction in service to try and better match the level of service to the demand and the budget that we had to work within. Um, there is a Federal Transit Administration rule that says if you make adjustments of that nature to your service, and they last 12 months or longer, you must do what's known as an equity analysis. Next slide, please. A Title VI equity analysis is done to determine whether the changes in your service have put an undue burden on any minority or low-income neighborhoods. So since we were coming up on a year in February, we performed, if I may take that off, we performed that equity analysis and part of that analysis is holding a public hearing to take comment. So in February, we held that public hearing. We received 12 comments. Um, most of those were in writing, but some were present at the meeting. And they covered a bunch of things, but about half of them we're requesting that GET return its service levels to normal and that that would include evening service. The service cuts that we implemented were to operate a Saturday schedule seven days a week. And Saturday service ends at seven o'clock at night. Weekday service previously operated until 11. As part of that public hearing, staff also presented a plan for restoring service to our service area over this next year. And our board has taken action at both the February meeting and then last night at their board meeting, after considering the comments that were received in February. And these are the changes that are coming. So let me summarize for you. Next slide, please. Um, the board has approved expanding what was formerly called RIDE 
which is in that red outlined area uh, in the southwest. It's an on-demand service that is much like Uber or Lyft. Uh, that is scheduled to be expanded to include that blue area in starting August, not August, April 4th, so in two weeks. In addition, they've authorized us to add an additional zone in July. We do believe that this service is the way of the future. While there will always be a demand for fixed route service, our ridership has recovered more robustly on this service than any of our other modes of service. They also um, have authorized us to increase weekday service on the Route 21 and 22, which are our heaviest traveled routes, back to what it was before the pandemic, which is 15-minute frequencies during the peak period. However, it still will terminate at 7 o'clock at night. Beginning July 4th, we will be implementing evening service on routes 21 and 22, route 44 and route 61. And that is dependent on resources, both financial and personnel, to be available to do that. We have seen a significant reduction in our workforce, and over the pandemic year, we've had a hiring freeze. We began in January hiring and training more bus operators in anticipation of ramping service back up. And then finally, the board has authorized us to look at uh, with the intention of implementing in January 2022 on-demand service, formerly RIDE, throughout the entire service area in the evening to uh, replace those other routes that I didn't mention earlier we would maintain those four routes, which were our heaviest used in the evening, and then overlay on demand on that. Now, you may ask, why don't you do that sooner? Uh, we'd love to do it sooner, but we have to have vehicles, we have to have budget, and we have to have personnel to do that. And we have certain union rules that only allow us to make changes in our service four times a year. So we do that in April, July, October, and January. So um, I think you can go to the next slide, which is my last slide. This is what the new on-demand vehicles look like. They're all wheelchair lift equipped. The two icons that you see above the word questions, the green one is for transit, and it will give you real-time information and route information on all of our fixed route service. And the other one is our on-demand. You click on that, you make a reservation just like you do with Uber or Lyft, and one of those vans will come get you and take you within that zone. So that concludes my presentation. I'd love to take your questions. Also here with me this afternoon is the Get Board Chair, Cindy Para. And uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. King.
Madam Clerk, did we receive any other public requests to speak on this particular item? We have one, Mayor. Okay, uh, would you please call that individual? And then after that, we'll take council comments. Uh, we need some technical assistance here uh, with council member Weir's screen with vice mayor. David Imad. Yes, Welcome. Uh, and can we have somebody help with the microphone over there? Uh, Lena, please. Welcome, Simon. Mr. Iman. Um, Ms. King, if you want to take a seat and then we'll have him speak and then you can come back up for questions. Welcome. Please state Thank your name. My name is David Iman. Um, I have been a bus rider for 30 years. Um, I was at the board meeting last night that Ms. King spoke about. I don't know why the comments from last night weren't in there. But there were no mention of these new services to us when we were sitting there. And out of her presentation, she's only using four routes. And only one of those routes, it goes downtown. And it doesn't do us any good if we can get downtown, but then we can't get, if our transfer point to downtown, and then there's no more buses coming except those four, you still can't go anywhere. I understand they wanna implement the ride at the beginning of next year, but we still have to deal with this year. They brought, this ride program in and they said they wanted to compete with Uber and Lyft. For the disabled community, they are Uber and Lyft because Uber and Lyft doesn't have those lifts for power chairs to get into. So when Git said they wanted to compete with Uber and Lyft, they, they have the equipment and there's, but because of these hour restrictions, it's still not allowing us to use it. We keep getting restricted, but yet we want to be a part of the community. And I know she has the drivers to do it. I know, and so does she. You don't ride this system for 30 years. I've seen it get better. And I'm not blaming Miss King for the pandemic. I'm really not. Because the pandemic hit everybody. That's why we're all sitting in the chamber wearing a mask, and I respect you all for letting us come in here and speak our mind. But we can't shut down Bakersfield at seven o'clock. We got bad air quality. They want more of us to ride the bus, but they're gonna stop at seven. That doesn't help us. You got people that are paying more, that are working two to three hours a day to pay for their Uber and their Lyft home because the buses aren't there to take advantage of Mrs. King's ride service. Now I have used the ride service and it's helpful in the zone that it's in. But if we have to wait another nine months to go citywide, that's going to hurt a lot of people in this community. There has to be some other changes they can make. I understand they can only do it four times a year. But there's got to be a way for her to service more of her community now and make less pertinent changes further down the road as we come further out of pandemics. Thank you, Mr. Yamat. Thank you very much. And now, Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you, Ms. King, and, and GET board members for coming tonight. I'm, I'm a little bit confused about what <laughs> 
you mentioned that the board voted on something last night and the, these gentlemen weren't there yet and, and what changes exactly were instituted then that, that they did I would be happy to clarify that. These gentlemen came to the board meeting and much like your council meeting, we have public comment at the beginning of the meeting. They made their public comments and then they left. And then the board took up the business of considering the service changes that were in the February public hearing, the comments that were received and the recommendations for responding to those comments. And they adopted those service restoration improvement redefinition, however you want to call it, um, that I spoke of earlier. So you are instituting night service? On again. four routes in July. And those routes basically cover the whole city or just they, certain areas? They, or? GET has been highly criticized in the past for having empty buses running around at night. We have done an analysis and looked at which bus routes were used in the evening. We have equipment on the buses that tells us every location someone gets on and off. And we have looked at that data and determined that those are the four most productive routes. So the four routes that were getting used in the evenings will be restarted in the evenings when? July 4th. Okay. We're not able to do it any sooner for two reasons. One, we are short on driver personnel and we have to add additional drivers. It's a six to eight week training period that doesn't include the recruitment screening and the time to do that. Additionally, our labor contract only allows us to change service four times a year, and it's changing on April 4th. The next time that we're able to do that is on July 4th. Okay, I understand. So I guess, I I want to thank the board for responding and, and, and thank Karen for responding to uh, constituent concerns and, and trying to restore service and, and get back to where you were. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. I first want to thank all of the speakers and those who are bus riders who made the time and effort to come down here and, and speak with us and do so consistently at our council meetings, I felt that your comments um, have been enlightening for me, and I just want to thank all of them. I know some had to leave. Um, Ms. King, thank you so much for being here today, and thanks to the two board members who represent the city to be here. And um, thank you also for your time on, the, on Zoom uh, a few days ago. Um, I'm excited about the on-demand service. I think that's the way of the future, and, and I think that's a good step forward for GET and for our community, but I think the, one of the challenges I see is how do we get from uh, how do we get to there from here and 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 providing high quality service to all of our community members. I think is the number one imperative imperative for me at, at this moment. I want to talk a little bit about the numbers and and the fare box. Um, you and I spoke a little bit about this in our one on one Zoom meeting. And I, I just, for the, for the benefit of my colleagues, want to kind of lift up some of the numbers that um, I discovered through our conversation. So from the period of April 2019 to March 2020, the fare box generated roughly $4 million, correct? And, and that dipped from the period of April 2020 to January 2021. That's not quite the same length of time, but I think it's telling that the fare box generated $2.1 million. Is that right? That's correct. So my, my question is, when do you anticipate the fare box uh, performing better and getting to, getting to normal, if you will? Do, do you have any modeling or any sense of 
of when I understand we're, we're now just opening up and that and things are hard to predict. But, but based on you know, industry standards and what's being discussed within the transit world, what are, you, what are you forecasting? It's going to be a long time. Okay. One of the things we know about transit riders is once you lose them, it's very difficult to get them back. And during the pandemic, um, we saw a dramatic drop off and for those people whose needs were not being met by the service, for example, people that may work in the evening, they have had to find other transportation during this period. And it's not likely they're going to come back to public transit anytime soon mm -hmm. because they've already gotten a ride from their coworker, purchased a used car, whatever means they found out uh, to help them. So we are hoping now we're moving into the red tier and businesses are opening and gyms are opening and all of that, uh, that ridership will come back. The primary thing that will contribute to that is the opening of school. Over 20% of our riders are students. We provide more than a million trips to students every year. So that will be a big uh, boost to our ridership. We do believe they will return because they typically are not drivers. And so, uh, we think that will help boost the ridership. The second most uh, reason people use it is to go to work. So as employment returns, we expect there will be people taking the bus to get to their jobs. But I can't predict is that six months, is that a year, are we going to have another back to the purple tier because people party over spring break? I, you know, yeah. I, I wish I could predict it because it would make our <laughs> lives a lot easier. I think we all do. Yeah. So <laughs> I appreciate that. So let me just get to my last question and it's regarding the CARES funding. So I, I was a bit uh, taken aback by this number, but uh, Get received $23 million? Yes, we did. $23.7 million? Almost $24 million? Yes. Okay. H how did Get uh, allocate those funds? Well, believe it or not, even though we were running reduced level of service because of all the things we had to do to respond to the pandemic, mm -hmm. like put plexiglass shields in the bus to protect the driver from... Um, customers getting on the bus, like uh, significantly increase, increasing our cleaning routines, providing PPE not only for our employees but for our customers. All those things um, have added significantly to our costs. So our operating costs were not particularly reduced, we'll see how we end the year in a couple of months, even though our service was reduced. So that money was used to fill the hole in the bucket from the fair revenues and the lost subsidies from the state primarily that fund our budget. Last night at our board's meeting, they also reviewed the preliminary budget for next year. And right now it has a $17 million deficit in it. So over the next three months before we adopt a new budget, we have to find $17 million of additional revenue or 
cuts. Now, we do expect to get some money from the bill that the president signed last week, the American Rescue Plan. We do not know what that will be yet because those allocations have not yet been made. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Councilmember Parlier. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Karen. We had a really Hi. nice uh, conversation, very informative, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, as you know, I've uh, sat on a uh, formal, informal board with GET, city staff, and members of the disabled community to help with uh, bus stop accessibility for the disabled and improving the, the red zone, uh, the blocking those areas for GET buses to, again, allow that accessibility. Um, I asked staff earlier, and you may have already done this when it came to your board, uh, to take down the numbers and contact information. Uh, and if you could have one of your staff members just please circle back to them and see if there's any other services that you can provide. Maybe you can help them out. Um, I think maybe the on-demand service is potentially going to fill that gap. But if you, again, please reach out. Um, I understand the difficulties that GET is facing right now, and uh, I hope there's brighter days ahead. And again, thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Parlier. Councilmember Gray. Thank you for coming, and there's been so much talk about this, and being new on the council, I'm learning a lot, so I appreciate you coming and bringing some light to the subject. I definitely have a heart of compassion <clears throat> for your writers. I can see their predicament. I can't imagine being in that position, so I, I definitely want to, you know, help to find um, solutions as, as you all are doing. Um, but I do have a couple of questions on this uh, on demand. How many vans are you all going to be putting on the road to take care of that? We actually have 16 vans that look like mm. the one in the picture and 21 what's referred to as a cutaway vehicle. You may have seen them. We presently provide our get a lift service, which is for people with disabilities who cannot access the fixed route. If I may have just one minute, mm -hmm. um, we have purchased new software and are really leading the nation in integrating our get a lift service, our ride service, our non-emergency medical service into one platform where currently there's a different vehicle dispatch to carry each one of those different type of clients. Now a single vehicle can be dispatched to carry them all on one vehicle if they're going reasonably the same place. So that will provide us greater capacity that we are the first in the nation to do this. So we're treading lightly, hoping that uh, it goes well, and that will begin in July. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, did I answer your question? You did, and I've got a couple others. So how many riders do you service on these on-demand? The vehicles mm -hmm. accommodate six to eight people. Mm -hmm. However, with social distancing, we're limiting the riders to three. So it's taking us more vehicles and more drivers mm -hmm. to deliver the same level of service that we were previously. And on the 40-foot buses, their capacity is 38 seated, and oftentimes we have people standing. We are limiting those to 15 riders. And when a driver, uh, which occurs usually around the first of the month, gets a load larger than that, we dispatch another vehicle and another driver to pick up the overload. 
that's going to be a challenge when school starts because we don't have enough vehicles and drivers to continue to limit that to 15 passengers per vehicle. So we're hoping we heard the CDC is considering reducing that social distancing requirement to three feet, which would allow us to increase that rider, those numbers of riders. Okay. So for the on demand though, do you know how many that, how many? Are Six to eight. No, I mean, in a week's time, how many people are you picking up and dropping? Oh, how many are we? Mm -hmm. We are currently carrying between 100 and 125 people a day. Wow. So there, there definitely is a need. Pre-pandemic, it was around 170 a day. Okay. And what percentage, these new routes that you're talking about that you're going to be offering evening service in July, how, what percentage of the city does that cover? It covers pretty much all of it, um, but there's gaps in between. Okay. They start in the northwest, they go through the central of t town, they go across Olive, down to Panama Lane, um, the east side, um, but it's farther between routes than if we were operating all of the service. Okay. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to understand the gentleman that was here, his comments versus what's really happening, because I'm not sure if he really understands, but you knowing this whole situation, are his comments, is he going to be taken care of? I mean, the, the challenges that he brought forward, are, are they Yes, be David addressed? Enod actually mm -hmm. is a member of our community advisory committee. Okay, okay. And is very active with us and uses our service widely. And uh, I don't know what his exact travel patterns are, but I think what he was referring to is when all the buses are riding, they come in, many of them, not all of them, but most of them come into downtown, people transfer between them and then go out to some other location. Um, not all of these routes, for example, the 61 starts at BC and it goes across Olive down Gosford to Panama and to the Walmart on Panama. So it will not be coming downtown. He will not be able to make a transfer from downtown okay. to that bus, is what I believe he was referencing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Councilmember Gray, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. So, at your meeting last night, uh, tell me what time your meeting starts and five thirty. At five thirty, and then public comments are pretty close. You know, quarter to six. Five thirty-five. Yeah. Um, so, if those writers would have chosen to stay instead of leaving, how much, how far into the night would they have had to stay? Well, the meeting ended about 8.30, but we promised anyone who was a public speaker that we would provide them a ride home. Okay. So of the people that were there and they wanted to speak, if they waited that long, would they have a ride home? Yes, they would. You know, we, we would have sent a special vehicle just for that trip. Okay, thank you. Um, it seems like to me that you and I met 14, 15 years ago? 12. 12, okay. <laughs> She's on it. At that meeting, we kind of talked about um, the senior community and the, and the expanding senior community out in, um, along 178 in uh, that area out there, and uh, the, the message I got was there's not going to be any service out there. So now it's 12 years later, and we've got a, a sizable senior committee out there. 
and we still don't have a ride for them. And I'm wondering if that's ever going to happen. Now that you have on demand and other things, because we talked about turnouts and everything else before. So now, are those people going to have access to public transportation? Until the economy recovers, it would be very difficult to make expansion plans to anywhere in the service area. But as the economy recovers and we're able to restore our budget, we certainly will take a look at that because I know that area has been growing. Uh, you may recall we held some community meetings about five years ago and did a survey uh, of those residents as to whether they would be interested in using the service. And there was not a large interest at that time, but you're right. A lot changes in five years, well, and it's probably time to do that again. And on demand changes things a lot, I'm yes, sure. Yes, it does. So with that little blue schematic that you gave us, I mean, we're talking a couple miles to get into that area, and you're I, what I'm looking for is, is that ever going to get some coverage? I don't have a yes or no answer for that. The best I can tell you is we will continue to evaluate it. It will not be in the next uh, 12 months. No, I wasn't asking for the next 12 months. I'm asking if there's a plan to include that community in public transportation. They I, have, I will none. tell you that we're working in conjunction with Kern Cog to do an update of our long range plan that's scheduled to happen this year and it will be looking out to 2050 and projecting the needs for public transit and the types of public transit that will be needed both in the near term, the mid term, and the long term. Is that going to be in a report that would be easily disseminated to the council? Yes, and there will be a robust public participation process that goes along with developing that plan. All right, thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Just following up on Vice Mayor's question, I. <clears throat> You stated that on demand was going to go citywide January of next year. And in then the evening. Not in the daytime? No. So no projection of when on demand would go citywide in the daytime? It's really a resource issue. It takes about 18 months to get vehicles. So, but it, that's the direction. That's the direction we are moving. And, okay, so citywide would include the area he's talking about or would not include? That's yet to be determined. So you do not serve the whole city? No, we do not. And you exclude areas because? Some areas are very difficult to serve because um, of the street network and the walled-in neighborhoods. But on demand goes anywhere. It's not, it's not a fixed route problem anymore. Correct. So why would the on Let, demand not serve the entire Can I give you just a little city? bit of a history lesson? No, that's yeah. too slow for me. I'm just, okay. I'm just sorry that if, if you're moving to on demand, it seems to me you would move to serve the whole city. You're right, and when we have the resources to do that, we will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. And Vice Mayor, do we have a uh, receiving file? Actually, actually, I'd like to follow up with a question. It, 
It seems to me that when you choose to exclude areas for whatever reason, because I know there are bus routes that you've got that I, I see constantly in a 40-foot bus, three people on it. Constantly I see that. And, and to exclude part of the city that is ripe for ridership, especially on on-demand, is it's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, we talked about this 12 years ago, and there was no resources then, and we're 12 years down the road, there's still no resources. I mean, are we not planning for that? And is, is nothing ever going to happen? Are we not planning for the entire city? Most counties in California have a local sales tax that supports public transit to provide more service than what they've had in the past. Okay, but I, I don't want to get into that because we have what we have. And if you want a county sales tax, then go out and pass a county sales tax. Mm -hmm. We did that here. So I want to know how you decide to do this and leave communities without any access to public transportation, none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Because as our subsidies have shrunk over the last 20 years, our service was reallocated from providing coverage to serving the most productive areas. Okay. I, I, I know, your, your resources dwindled, everybody's resources dwindled. I understand that. But the fact that you have no anticipation at all of covering the city in the future is mind-boggling to me. I, I do not understand that. And I won't ever understand it, and I don't want, I'm, well, I'm not gonna be here 12 years from now, but there better be some resources allocated to the entire city, or, or Things are going to have to change. I mean, we can't just continue this way. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Arias. Hi, good evening. Oh, forgot the mic. Uh, thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure to meet you. I think this is our first time. I'm new to the council, so thank you so much for coming, and pleasure to see my friends in the back from the get board. Uh, I just have a, a quick follow-up question, and I, I'm trying to understand the staffing challenges that you guys are facing. I mean, we're, we're dealing with that here at the city with, with some of our departments, so we can, we can relate and certainly understand what you guys are going through. Um, but one thing that occurred to me is that if we are utilizing, um, you know, if we are converting, you know, bus drivers that would typically run a fixed route and we're using them now for this on-demand service. I'm obviously that's serving fewer people, um, and if it's secluded to a particular area, um, we're really uh, hyper focused on the particular pro project areas and serving those communities and really doing a disservice to the rest of them. So I'm curious. My question is, you know, what percentage of staffing in terms of bus drivers are being allocated for this new on-demand? service versus the traditional fixed routes that serve the entire city? That's a great question, and I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but I can get it for you. It's approximately 30 drivers out of 250. Okay. But I'll get the exact number for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Arias. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to go back to the Vice Mayor's comments because I find them compelling. Um, and I, I believe that with, I mean, one of the reasons why I believe in the on-demand service is that it is more nimble and it is, um, it gives us the ability to cover more area. And so, it's harder for me to understand why we can't uh, provide service to the to the to the neighborhood uh, Councilmember Weir is referring to. 
Um, so I wonder if, 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 if it's appropriate, Mr. Nero, if, if I can make a motion to direct our representatives on the Get Bus Board to begin advancing um, towards making a plan to cover this, this particular area. Yes, sir, that would be appropriate. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Weir, I don't wanna overstep on you, but. I will accept any help I can get. Okay, I'd like to make that motion to direct our um, get board representatives to begin pursuing uh, service in uh, the respective neighborhood al along with receiving and filing this presentation. Thank you, you have a motion? Please cast your votes. Thank you. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. King. May I ask for clarification on the motion? Is that specifically on-demand service, or is that all of our transit service? Uh, the motion is um, was made with the intent of exploring all services to provide coverage to that particular thank you. neighborhood, thank so you. whether that be on demand or traditional routes. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. King. Uh, Madam Clerk, we need to move on to the next one. Thank you for your presentation. We still have two items to cover. Under workshops, item B: update on economic development strategic plan. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Mayor and Council, it's a pleasure to talk about this topic today. The, the intent was to set aside time for Council to dig into um, some discussion on a, a key element of this presentation, and those are our target growth sectors. Um, there's a desire to set some context for that, but we're gonna try and move pretty fast given our timing through some of these other slides. You have the material in front of you and we can refer to that. Um, but, but we'll try and push fairly quickly up to about slides um, 11 to talk about the actual recommended um, t target clusters at this point in time based on the analysis that we have to date. Really quickly, uh, we wanted to just acknowledge um, uh, with this uh, vision you know, slide that there are many elements to a citywide vision that would include public safety and, and quality of life. But for economic development specifically, through this strategy, we're trying to answer for development, what will happen in the next 20, uh, 10, 20 years? Who are we gonna be uh, known as and, and how we're gonna move forward? Um, th what we're talking about today, again, are those target clusters, uh, but I've been listening closely to council over this last year, and, and I just wanted to reflect uh, really quickly some of the key themes I've been hearing. Uh, we wanna be the most business-friendly city in California. I've heard that loud and clear. Uh, we want to focus on entrepreneurship and small business development. Affordability needs to maintain a, a, an important factor. And we need to move uh, towards creating the talent and, and the jobs in this community um, that will support a, a more diverse economy. And one of those key elements, again, is where do we target some of our growth? Also, really quickly, for B3K, there are going to be some key findings that are coming forward soon. and and wanted to just set some of the stage for that out of a market assessment out of B3K. I'm not gonna speak to each one of these bullets, but we'll lift up the fact that we do have challenges. We have some needs to develop our workforce, address educational issues and, and job training issues. The economic development ecosystem here in the region is not built for success today, and there's gonna need to be some um, movement around that to get us prepared to be successful into the future. Uh, I think it's uh, worth noting that we've been doing good work with the B3K process to make sure our analysis lines up with theirs as far as our strategic plan market assessment and that the target growth sectors are consistent with um, the, the B3K. So I'm actually gonna jump forward because of time and again we'll be circling back to this B3K issue. I just wanted to lift up some of those key issues that you're gonna be hearing more about into the future. Um, 
So we have Roger Dale with us from the Nelson Dale Group. We're going to ask him to come forward and, and uh, share some updates. Uh, but again, um, you know, we've talked about moving quickly, but even Roger, maybe even quicker than we had uh, expected initially, to just give us a little bit of a, a place in time and a sense of how we came at these target clusters, and then we'll get into the clusters. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Good evening, Mayor Go, Vice Mayor Weir, members of the council. I'm Roger Dale with the Nattleson Dale Group, and as many of you know, we are working for the city on the preparation of an economic development strategy. And I'm gonna talk to you tonight about one specific aspect of that, which is, as Mr. Clegg mentioned, the selection of target industry clusters that would be the basis for really implementing your vision for what the city of Bakersfield and the community, community of Bakersfield can become economically in the future. And so I'm gonna, in the interest of time, go through this fairly quickly because I wanna share, uh, have plenty of time to, to share discussion with you and get your input. So we have been involved with this process for about eight months now and have gone through most of the analytical stages of it. And we are now at a point where we're actually going to be preparing within the next couple of months the strategy or action plan for implementation. A lot of this work has included uh, public engagement, including interviews with uh, the council members, each of you individually. Uh, I know we know, have some new members and we'll be glad to get your input now that you're part of the process as well. We've had a couple of roundtable meetings with the development community, another focused on downtown stakeholders, and we've been very closely coordinating with the B3K process, including several work groups that are focused on specific uh, industry clusters. And we've also got a marketing process going on that we can describe later. Um, and I will kind of really quickly cut to the bottom line this evening is that we have, through our own process and also through coordination with uh, the B3K process, identified a preliminary list of targeted industries for growth in Bakersfield. And you can think of this as the what stage of the process. In other words, what are our targets going to be for future growth in Bakersfield? In the next couple months, we'll be getting to the how stage. How do you implement these ideas and carry it out so that you can begin to experience the economic growth that these potentially offer? Um, we have a couple of themes that you're gonna see in, reflected in the selection of target industries. First of all, there is an overall theme of uh, promoting Bakersfield as a place for in innovation and technology. And we have gone through a process which identifies industries that are either present in Bakersfield at some stage of development or could be present here that have technology elements to them. And the focus on that is, is for the, the the primary reason that those are the types of industries that have the potential to create jobs that will move your economy forward. The, you know, the overriding challenge that Kern County and Bakersfield face now is you've got a tremendous investment in historically in a couple of major industries, oil and agriculture, which have various challenges, especially in the oil and gas industry that there's going to be a need to create jobs that will potentially replace those at comparable income levels to the jobs that have historically been very strong in, in the oil and gas industry. Um, next slide, please. So we've, we wanna focus on high tech and not only in terms of industries, but in terms of worker pr preparation and development, workforce development. And as an example of that focus, we are recommending a focus on uh, a theme of automated transportation and mobility. In other words, technologies that relate to uh, new, new types of vehicular travel, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, and this ties closely with a number of strong themes or emerging themes in Kern County. First of all, there are a number of existing or potentially strong industries, including agriculture, aerospace, oil, and logistics, that could have a connection directly to that theme of automated transportation. It also has a benefit of actually functionally improving the quality of life in the city and making it a more attractive quality of, from a quality of life perspective to the types of workers who would be employed in technology industries and become future residents of Bakersfield. And in that regard, it 
can just generally elevate your image as a tech-friendly location. And finally, I'll note that uh, KernCog is uh, currently working on a similar project related to autonomous uh, freight-enhanced testing uh, technologies that, again, ties back to one of your core industries, logistics. So we think this is a theme that can potentially tie together a number of innovation-oriented activities in the future in Bakersfield. So to get to the, to the end result of our recommendations, we are recommending a focus on four major industry clusters. And when I talk about clusters, it's a kind of, they're kind of broad umbrellas, each one of which incorporates a number of specific industries that we can ultimately target as potential growth sectors for Bakersfield. The four areas are logistics, advanced business services, manufacturing, and again with a focus on technology-related manufacturing, and environmental services. And if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll drill down a little bit into some of the details of what those industries include or could include. Logistics, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with as uh, it's been a very strong growth sector in, in Bakersfield in recent years. And we're certainly that would include e-commerce, fulfillment centers, et cetera. But we're especially interested in the connection to technology. Bakersfield and Kern County are leaders nationally in logistics services. You could also potentially be leaders in the development and application of uh, logistics technology. Next group is advanced business services, and this includes the, the things from banking to accounting, engineering, and uh, what are sometimes called back office or second office facilities. This is one of the areas that the B3K process has actually developed a work group of local firms who are working with us to uh, advance ideas about how Bakersfield and Kern County could better leverage its position to be a second office location for firms in other parts of the state that are looking for options to their higher cost locations. Uh, manufacturing, and this really just includes some representative ideas, but uh, not the full list. Some things related to food processing, uh, navigation and detection equipment, instruments manufacturing, electronic motors, and aircraft parts. All of these things have, again, a technology focus, but have a strong root, uh, strong, strong roots that would be appropriate for a manufacturing workforce. Environmental services could include uh, a focus on carbon management and renew renewable fuels production. Could also include some higher tech R&D uh, activities in engineering and life sciences. And I won't go through these in great detail, but again, I've listed those, and we've kind of looked at basic criteria that would make them attractive as potential targets for growth. And I've just listed these atop the, uh, across the top of the slide. First of all, is it a growing industry in Kern County or nationally and something that you would expect to have a, a big pie that you could get, could get a piece of in the future? We've also looked specifically at things that have shown a propensity to be leaving coastal areas like Los Angeles as a prime example that might be, in many cases, moving out of state but could potentially be attracted to Kern County because of being closer to their core markets but still offering many of the advantages uh, cost-wise that they would be seeking. Uh, looked at opportunities to build on existing strengths and either things that are already here or are related to things that are already here. Uh, things that would tend to attract new talent in terms of a technology workforce. And things that are, have opportunities to diversify your economy so that in the future you are more resilient uh, for, from shocks to the system like we're currently seeing, in, for example, in potentially in the oil and gas industry. One concept I'd like to talk about tonight on a preliminary basis is looking at the potential development of a technology park that could be a physical and I would also say kind of a thematic location to attract the national attention for Bakersfield as a place where these technology sectors are thriving or could thrive. And I'm gonna go through some examples in a moment, but essentially a technology park is a, a business park 
that typically has a connection to an institutional partner, a university, some other type of, a, in some cases, a military uh, or other federal research organization. But it's the concept of a partnership that leverages the presence of that institution to create commercial development opportunities. And so some of the relationships that could be developed here would be naturally Cal State Bakersfield, uh, potentially even connections to universities and institutions outside Kern County that are looking for a place where they would have space to do development. Uh, could have a connection to downtown Bakersfield and it maybe as a satellite to a, a facility. And potentially there could be a connection to the uh, aerospace and the federal concent concentration of federal activities in East Kern County. This is a type of thing that would be developed through a number of partnerships and programmatic relationships, including direct relationships to industries, uh, state and federal funding opportunities, city and county investments, infrastructure investments. Uh, the city could also support it through flexible zoning that would attract the types of uses or accommodate the types of uses that we're targeting, and could also include other special city or county incentives to make it an especially attractive opportunity for the things that you're most interested in attracting and could in effect function as an incubator facility for the industries that we're talking about. And all of this could be wrapped into the city's marketing and branding uh, messages. Next slide. Um, and I'll, I won't go through this in detail, but we've listed here the, the target recommended industry clusters that I've described to you a moment ago, logistics, advanced business services, manufacturing and environmental services. And I've also listed the, the activities that were identified by the Brookings or B3K process, keeping in mind that that was a countywide process, not necessarily focused just on Bakersfield, but they've included aerospace, advanced manufacturing that aligns closely with ours, business services, again, one of the things that we've looked at, and carbon management and renewable fuels production which again would align closely with our category of environmental services. The point of this slide is that each of these or many of these has a technology connection or focus that could be part of what comes, to, comes into to play at the, a technology park. I'm just gonna go through a few examples and because of time I'm not gonna really say much about them but just mention that we are in the process of profiling a number of existing technology parks throughout the country that have characteristics, none of them is exactly what we would envision for Bakersfield, but each has characteristics that might apply. And I think in the interest of time, I'll just mention them and go through the slides. So University of Arizona has a technology park, uh, Cummings Research Park in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, the Nebraska Innovation Campus that's a, a, a university connection, and University of Illinois Research Park in Champaign-Urbana, and then finally, uh, a tech park in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, and, and the, you can't necessarily read all that, but it's, it shows all the partners that are involved in that, and that's very much what we would see would be the, the likely strategy in Bakersfield, is to pull together a number of these elements, perhaps starting with Cal State Bakersfield as an anchor, but really bringing together a number of public and private partnerships to promote a theme of innovation in Bakersfield. Uh, last one here is San Marcos, Texas, and then the next slide. Last thing I wanted to mention is that another potential anchor for a focus on innovation and technology or another potential vehicle for promoting that would be through your sister city connection with uh, Busan, South Korea. And they have in that community, in that city, an eco, what they call an eco-friendly complex which essentially functions as the type of a technology park that we're describing. And I, I, in the interest of time, I won't go more into these, but we would see this as, as a kind of a dual opportunity. It's a model for what could happen in Bakersfield in terms of a technology park, but that actual relationship with uh, the sister city uh, could be a vehicle for promoting trade as well as uh, the technology connections that we are uh, seeking through this strategy. I think I'll skip to the next slide, actually. So I'd like to reserve the rest of our time this evening for a discussion with you. Uh, we've kind of gone through very quickly what we're recommending as target industries. We've talked about the potential of leveraging that through 
uh, a theme on automated transportation and mobility. Uh, we've talked briefly about the tech park concept and the sister city connection. And down on the bottom of the slide, I've kind of listed what we're, our real objectives today are, and I apologize that we've had to kind of rush through this, but to uh, give the council an opportunity, opportunity today to provide feedback on the recommended target industries, and we'll take a minute and kind of go back through them one at a time, and then discuss some of these concepts for implementation. In other words, is there general support for the concept of investigating a tech park as one of the strategies? Maybe some additional input on the sister city concept, and especially interested in your input on the concept of building around the theme of automated transportation. So I'd like to advance the slide and I would, of course, welcome questions on anything, but what I'd specifically appreciate your input on is the four industry cluster categories that are listed again on this slide. And keep in mind that these are broad headings that would incorporate a number of specific industries that, that are detailed in our reports. But what I think would help this evening is if, if you would look at each of these and provide initial reactions that anything on this list that you would question? And then maybe, is there anything on this list or anything you're, you would think you'd like to see on the list that hasn't necessarily been mentioned or discussed yet this evening? It's possible that something you might be thinking of would fit under one of these headings, but I wanna make sure that at the end of the process, we've got a, your input in terms of, is there anything here you'd, you have questions about or maybe would wanna reconsider? Is there anything you'd like to add? Or are there any specific components of these that you'd like to see us especially focus on. So maybe I'll first take a minute and ask if there are any general questions and then we can come back and talk about your input on the target industry clusters. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Dale. Thank we'll go to the public me. first. Madam okay. uh, City Clerk, uh, did we receive any requests to speak? We have not. So I'll open it up now to my colleagues for uh, input. Councilmember Freeman. Yeah, I like the industry cl clusters. Um, one question. Uh, uh, I notice energy is not on the list. And we think of ourselves as an energy center, as a solar, wind, oil, gas. <laughs> and I'm wondering, is that because we don't really uh, do any of that research, uh, technical stuff here, they just use our farms to put the solar <laughs> farms on. And, you know, we pump the oil out of the ground, but the research is done in Houston. Do we, is, uh, is there a reason that uh, energy is not on this list? That's kind of the first question. Well, I think that some components of energy are included under environmental services. There's a, there's a our, our expectation that, that would include different types of renewable energy. It would also include concepts like carbon management or carbon sequestration. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is in there. Certainly glad to consider the idea of pulling it out as a separate heading if you think that's more appropriate, but that's, th that's where it is. I would say that the, both our study and the B3K process acknowledge the, the huge importance of the oil and gas industry in Kern County and the, and the tremendous challenges potentially facing that industry largely uh, due to st state regulations or, or policies. And that, my understanding is the B3K process will be addressing that as a kind of a regional policy issue that needs to be dealt with at the state level and, and through other means. So we're not suggesting that you're gonna abandon that industry and, and certainly it's part of the focus that yes, from a Advocacy, advocacy standpoint, we need to do what we can to maintain the strength and viability of that industry as long as, it, as that can happen. What we're trying to anticipate though is as there are potentially losses of jobs in that area, what are, mm -hmm. what are industries that can replace, that can create new jobs that replace those at levels that support the same incomes and, and quality of life. Okay, a uh, couple other questions. One, mm -hmm. um, I noticed uh, ag is not on here, but a lot of 
ag innovation is done here. Uh, and the skills and the history is here in, you know, designing new varieties uh, and pest resistant varieties. And didn't they replace all the French vines with stuff from Bakersfield? Uh, and, you know, they invent a lot of stuff in the ag industry here and do a lot of science and research. And I wondered, is that, you know, or you could consider, is that an area for growth since we have the talent is here? Uh, I think, you know, Fresno maybe is a little bigger center, but uh, it seems like we have an awful lot of talented people and companies doing that here. They export all over the world with unique things they've invented. And I thought, well, maybe that is that a potential growth area or not. But I, I just throw that out if <laughs> to put on your list. Um, uh, another question is, you know, manufacturing. I've always felt we were the ideal place for manufacturing because we have a uh, sort of a strong workforce that knows how to do that kind of work. In fact, that's probably the largest part of a work, but we have been shut down by the state and all that moved to other states because of air quality concerns that they were, you know, releasing methane or lacquers. You can't paint anything. You can't bake anything. You can't. And I'm wondering, have we solved those problems now so that the manufacturing and assembly could come back here and expand here? Uh, you know, a lot of it is they do it in L.A. with terrible air quality. I don't know why they can't do it here. Ours is no worse than theirs. And uh, so I'm assuming that a lot of those air quality problems have been solved because we used to make things here, you know, furniture, all sorts of things, but it was driven out primarily because of air quality, quote, concerns, and they continued doing it in L.A. with just as bad of air. So um, that would be one that I think we have a workforce for. So, uh, and last, I'll put a little, uh, you know, plug in for the tech park because I talked to Roger extensively <laughs> already about the tech park idea uh, because I thought we should be doing that. And uh, what I found was that there aren't any that were not focused around a major university. And the two kind of go together, and, and many of these had huge, you know, land adjacent to the university, given to the university, the campus is expanded, and okay, they have all that, but they don't, you know, U of A's is not, it's like 15 minutes down the freeway, and it's the biggest one in the country, so um, I think that's one that could really transform our community, but we have to transform our university too. We started talking with them, the, they, they have to boot up, and we will need, I think we need to start with our lobbying efforts, putting pressure on Sacramento if they're going to shut down our major industry and take away th tens of thousands of jobs, high paying jobs. They're gonna have to make some big investments down here to help this region grow and become a new region. And that involves a much expanded big university, research university, and bringing big resources in because the university will have to grow in, in, in substance and in size uh, to make, to bring tech here. Because you, you just can't have a growing tech sector without a big, growing, high-powered university behind it. Uh, so it's kind of something we should all become aware of. Uh, we're, we will have to figure out how to get major investment from the state down here. And they all have had, they all have, there are lots of grants all sorts of public funds go into all of these. They don't do it just with private <coughs> funds or city funds. Big grants come from the federal government, state governments to make these tech parks work. So uh, I, th I think we sort of have to try myself. And you can have more than one. They don't have, you know, people do more than one. But um, if we could just get one going, we have a major development company that has the land and is willing to sort of set it aside if we pull it all together close to the university. So we've got a lot of the ingredients ready to go, but it's still a big, big effort to, um, to put one of these together. But I, I personally uh, I like to encourage us all to take a hard look at that. And I'd like to jump in really quickly through the chair to your comments, Councilmember Freeman. I think we're gonna go back and watch the tape and, and just um, 
copy verbatim some of your comments uh, as really good advocacy points. And Mr. Ortiz is here in the audience, and you know that there is a push through B3K to make that case that you're making, and those are really good points. And I would just say both on the oil industry and energy industry as well as agriculture, those are core components of our current economy and that we acknowledge that we're looking at where do we try and grow, where do we incentivize and, and target some additional and new growth. And I would just jump in on the, the agricultural piece on the manufacturing, I think it fits there where taking raw goods and instead of shipping our raw goods that are produced here very well and sending them away like some that are sort of turning those into other products. To, to me, that this speaks to advanced manufacturing. It's taking uh, those raw goods and adding value to them through a, the manufacturing pro and processing process. And that's part of, in my mind, what um, the growth target cluster number three is about as well. Thank, uh, I'm done. Thanks, Roger. Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. Vice Mayor. Um, thank you, Mayor. So, um, I have a couple questions, but um, I just want to give a big shout out here for the University of Nebraska because that was an impressive picture, and ah. <laughs> I really liked that. So, um, as it, you know, as we're sitting here right now, and these are four clusters, um, and, and then as we look at ten years from now, some of these may not even be around anymore. So how do we, how do we, how do we do evolve and say, this is what we want based on this is what, I mean, how do we get there from here? You, yes. In a short answer, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna require bold investments, not just from the city, but from this region and from the private sector. And what we are, what our plan will lay out is where are the most critical investments that can be made that can be leveraged to attract the type of bold investments that would, would need to happen for this to move forward. Um, I think that Councilmember Freeman is correct in terms of a tech park, for example, could attract, I would expect it would attract potential significant funding in terms of state and federal grants. And I think that, that Kern County and Bakersfield are in a, a tremendous position to expect those because of what has the policies that are impacting your economy and potentially can have some, some very severe consequences if there's not a very robust plan to move the economy forward. So. It's a difficult question, I know. Yeah, I know. so that's, that's the job, but it, it, what, what I'm saying is that this is something that will not be resolved by the document we create in the next couple of months. It's gonna require ongoing investment and sense of urgency in the community to, in effect, transform the economy. As every plan does. Right, and the, the point about Cal State Bakersfield and how it potentially anchors a tech park the B3K process has pointed out a number of areas where Kern County lags, not just for because it's a you know it's not a large city like Los Angeles or San Francisco, but even among pure pure cities across the nation that are comparably otherwise comparable in size and economy, you lag in terms of innovation and investment and other things that would make you an attractive center for those types of activities. Yeah, but yeah, all of those I, need to be, those are not just afterthoughts. You know, economic development involves marketing and trying to position your, your message out in the, out in the economy and the, in the, the way the world sees you. But that marketing message only gets you as far as the investments and in all those foundations that make a community and a region attractive. Right, and, and we had conversations about tech park and technology hubs and that stuff too, so mm -hmm. I understand that, but um, and it's gonna require a major change in outlook philosophy and, mm -hmm. and how we do business around here. I totally understand that, and I'm, I couldn't be more anxious to get started. I'm so happy you put the Bouchon in here. <laughs> I am so happy because I got a message from them. They are waiting for us to tell them 
how they can help us, how we can interact, how we can learn from each other, how we can develop best practices. They are waiting for this. I, I got a message from them three days ago. They're saying, you know, what, what are you guys doing? What's going on? Because they're, they're absolutely waiting. So maybe out of this conversation, we could just get something in place that we can start engaging them. Because they, uh, this is exactly what they want to do. They want, they want exchange. They want ideas. They want, they'll help us, and we can help them, and do the well, whole process. I think it's, a, I think it's a tremendous opportunity, and we, and that will definitely factor it. That will be incorporated in our plan. How do, how do you leverage that relationship, and it benefits both sides. Okay. And I appreciate you saying that, but I need to be able to respond to them, and you know, because I just got three days ago, and, and they've been waiting for a couple of months. <laughs> so I, I, Christian, whoever can help me with this, because I don't want them to lose interest in it. Sure. You know, we can set up a, a, a Zoom with them. We've been Zooming with our sister cities as an initial step with the key people. Uh, and yeah, I, I, and I appreciate that, Mayor. But we need we need to be talking with Su Hyun Kim. Yeah. And get her going, and we need to interact with her because she's the one that disperses the information to the people that we need to talk to. If we need to get the mayor, but Sean involved in this, we need to talk with her because she's the one that can get that done. So, however, I can answer her in the next in a short period of time and let her know where we're going and how they can help us and how we can help them. I really need that information. So. I will be glad to connect with staff tomorrow and, and figure out how we come up with a, a near-term response, knowing yeah. that there, there's still work to be done, but we can at least keep them, keep the ball moving. Okay, and I will forward the text that I got from her to you, and so I, I, I just don't wanna lose this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I know there are several of you who still want to speak, but just to let our audience know that after this, we're going to go into closed session for a minimum of 15 minutes. So uh, the start of the 515 meeting will be considerably delayed. So if any of you need to step out for a bit, uh, you're welcome to do that. Councilmember Arias. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you, Roger. It's great to see you, and thank you so much, Nick, as well. I see you in the back for uh, doing this, uh, envisioning for... Uh, our workforce and our economic development for the city and the county. I appreciate that uh, so very much. I think there are a few things that we can do as a council and as a city more important uh, than investing uh, in this way and creating jobs and, and job growth in our community. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. I, I think this is a perfect segue, Roger, so I appreciate you teeing this up. And uh, just to add on to uh, Council Member Freeman's comments, one of the things that we have uh, certainly is a, a capable uh, labor and workforce uh, here in the city, but I think uh, there's more to that. Uh, in, in Ward 1 specifically, and in and around Brundage Lane, I think when it comes to logistics and manufacturing, I think we have a crown jewel that has a little bit of dust on it. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we have, you know, the proper zoning uh, right there for industrial um, uh, development and, and investment there, but in addition to that, you know, its proximity to some of the transportation vessels, including the 99, including Highway 58, which is one of the few routes that heads over the Sierra Nevadas here in the valley. Um, and in addition to that, um, it being a federal economic opportunity zone, I think is one of those things that we're looking for in terms of leveraging some of those opportunities at the federal, the state, and the local level. Um, and so I would like to make a referral to staff uh, to do a little bit of research and strategizing in and around uh, the Brundage Lane Navigation Center to see how we can polish that, package that, uh, and invite some capital investment uh, to create some much needed jobs here in Kern County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Arias, Councilmember Gray. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Roger, for the presentation tonight. It is exciting because we've, we've got to be looking towards our future. You know, we can't just be. Um, happy with what we're doing now, that's for sure. So one thing that's been on my heart that I've spoken to a Christian about, or city manager, I've spoken to our mayor about, and other council members, 
that we were, my husband and I have been in the trades and been uh, general contractors in Kern County now since 1983. And we have run up against a huge crisis, not only in Kern County, but nationally, um, to where we don't have enough tradesmen any longer to support the electrical trades, the, the plumbing, the drywall, the HVAC carpentry. When we go to try to find help, um, it can take us up to two years to finally find somebody that's qualified. That is for every five people that are retiring from the trades, there's only one coming in. And the trades are an area where kids, that I, I appreciate all this logistics and technology and all this, but there's a lot of people that their mind doesn't work that way. And uh, their, their hands are what they use to work with. And if we could incorporate this some way to where we could bring a trade school into Kern County, our young people that are coming out of high school instead of falling through the cracks because they're not college bound, they now have another opportunity to where they can support their families. A lot of the, the people that we employ, most of them are making more money than a lot of college students coming out because they are very well talented, very well qualified. So they can be high paying jobs depending on how you know, much they want to learn. And I think that would suit uh, Kern County very well. I didn't see, I was looking in your categories to try to figure out, well, where would that fit in? And I really couldn't see where it would be. Maybe manufacturing, but um, that's something you would have to figure out for. So I would ask that you would look into that. Thank yeah. you. I, uh -huh. I should mention, separate from the target industries, we've also focused on commercial industrial real estate development opportunities, and that's kind of a separate part of the strategy, so I can see that's where that would fit in. Okay. And the intent is that you, you have these other industries growing, that's what creates the demand for construction of new facilities. In other words, mm -hmm. you, you have to have something, some engine in the economy that creates development growth, especially for commercial industrial, and the intent is that these are the drivers, but that creates the real estate development opportunities that is the other part of this process that right. I didn't really touch on tonight. And certainly the, the question about the trade school, this is something we hear pretty much everywhere we, we work. This is a common problem and, and we- Oh, it's terrible. It's something that's kind of a major gap in our education system that I think would be a very good fit for this type of a region, so. Yes, I mean, if you bring in all these new jobs through these other, other clusters mm -hmm. and you can't build homes fast <laughs> enough for these yeah. people to live here, they're not gonna be able to move to Bakersfield. And right now, our real estate market is so hot and there's such, they, they have you know, very few homes on the market. I mean, houses are selling in a day to a week. Mm -hmm. um, so we definitely need to be looking into that. And, I, and again, I'm trying to capture those, those young people that aren't college bound, that mm -hmm. can find another way out and not end up in crime and gangs and everything else because they, they don't have a skill. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gray. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I just want to reinforce a couple things that have already been said, just to add my two cents. Uh, I think the opportunity of mm -hmm. Bouchon is a really unique opportunity, and, and I agree with Vice Mayor that that really should be followed up on. Um, we're looking for something unique, uh, and a lot of things you've talked about, other cities are already doing, and. I think this is a unique opportunity that, that Bakersfield could be set apart with. Uh, and I would also reinforce the manufacturing that Councilmember Freeman mentioned. I think, you know, when manufacturing left the United States, you know, cheap labor in other countries and stuff, and now manufacturing is much more about robotics, and, and there are reasons why we would have advantages now. And to move and expand that area of our economy makes sense to me also. Uh, so that's my comments, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. 
Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you so much for the presentation today. And, um, you know, I, another colleague made the point earlier, but I want to echo it. Um, you know, it is important to recognize that in this globalized economy that um, you know, things are moving at, at record speed. And, um, and it's important for us to be agile and be able to pivot uh, in times when, you know, key industries may not be an opportunity for us. And so um, I appreciate that. I, I did uh, pick up on a comment you made, and perhaps I'm um, jumping the gun here or getting too, too ahead of myself because tonight was about the what and next phase is about the how. Uh, but you did ma mention uh, significant investments are required. And so um, another key point that you referenced in your report was th the need to attract new talent and also to retain talent. You know, folks who are brought up here, retaining them in our local, um, in, our re in our region. Um, and so I, I wondered if in that next phase, in the how phase, we're talking about actual infrastructure requirements, uh, quality of life, we know from plenty of uh, places elsewhere that you know enhancements to the quality of life of a community really uh, do well in terms of attracting uh, a talent, talented workforce. Yes, so we, when we develop the strategy, we've got the, the vision in terms of target industries, what we'd like to see grow, but then the actual strategy or implementation components of it are usually focused around what we call foundations. So foundations would include physical infrastructure, would include workforce development, and talent attraction or talent retention would be certainly a part of that. It would include uh, issues dealing with quality of life because those directly relate back to talent development sure. and attraction. And it would also include, uh, in this case, potentially uh, investments in, uh, for example, the infrastructure at Cal State Bakersfield, not yep. necessarily city investments, but the, the types of changes that could occur at that institution that would bring it to the level of other communities that have attached, for example, attached tech parks to a university. They're typically larger universities than Cal State Bakersfield. But in the examples we looked at, that's generally the case, and we're trying to find some that would be a, a good model size-wise, but in general, we would see that, that that institution can evolve over time, can be, there can be reinvestment over time to have a, make it a, a stronger anchor for the type of technology-oriented economy that we're, we have a vision for as part of this strategy. So what's the timing for that, that piece, coming back to the council? The, the, you mean the timing for the plan or for the implementation? The, the plan. The, the plan will be drafted by the end of May. And the reason, the time frame is partly driven by the, the B3K process. We're having the opportunity to uh, participate in a number of industry work groups that are connected to these target industries. So we're getting direct input from industry leaders to understand what, what are the levers that the public sector can pull that would facilitate major transformation or growth in that industry. So to answer your question, we're, that process is taking time. We anticipate uh, having a draft document by essentially June, June 1st or in that vicinity for to come back to you and, and kind of discuss what some of those, those ideas are, knowing that it's preliminary at that point and you have a chance to kind of re respond to it. Part of what this will include is recommendations for partnerships so that we're not just talking about city resources sure. or city activities, but what are the regional partners, public and private, that can leverage the city's investment and collectively bring about the, the, this transfer, transformation that we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to make a referral tonight as well. Uh, you know, as we, as we talk about this plan, as we talk about uh, Vice Mayor Weir's um, vision, economic vision, and bringing up the example of Bouchon, which I think is a, is a great one. As we've talked for several years now on various different needs and, and, and hopes for game-changing projects in the community, I'd like to ask the sta staff to develop a list of, of seven to 10 
uh, game-changing projects, big investments that the city might pursue in the future and bring that to council so that we can have a discussion about those. And then also opportunities for us to fund those. And so I'm looking at current taxes, measure and spending allocation. And the reason why there's a sense of urgency is because we're getting ready for the upcoming budget season. Uh, but their, their reference is uh, funds for the future uh, allocation, which I think is a great title actually. Uh, for for game-changing projects, um, they're saying at least 50 million, perhaps it's 100 million over 10 years, uh, and or perhaps we bond against uh, Measure N funds so that we can invest in big game-changing projects for the city of Bakersfield, uh, and do that sooner than later. And so, uh, I'd like to ask staff to to kind of develop that list and then come back to us with uh, ways for us to to pursue those options as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. I don't see any other requests to speak. Yeah. Mayor Go, could I ask just one qu quick request? We've had a chance to go through the four industries, and I really appreciate the input. I think everything you've said has been on target with what I'd hope to get this evening, and, the, and that will help us to refine and finalize this list. I wanted to, and we've talked about the tech park, I wanted to just kind of get a general impression of the concept of the theme of automated transportation as a technology focus. Just kind of a you know, general thumbs up, thumbs down from the council. I don't want to pursue that too, too heavily if there's, if, you know, if there's not enthusiasm for it, but that, that is kind of one of the recommendations at this point and be glad to discuss it, but just wanted to generally see if that's a direction you would see us going as part of a theme for this uh, project. Thank you, Council Member Weir, Vice Mayor. Um, frankly, I don't know how you could list logistics without automated transportation, mm -hmm. because in 10 years from now, there's not going to be truck drivers like we have now. There's not going to be. It, it's all going to change. So if we're not ready for it. We're, we're going to lose that area. So absolutely, it's part of it, for me anyway. For one council member, I don't see how you could ignore it. And I think the opportunity is not just that Bakersfield's ready for it, but that you're in a position to enable other economies around the country to adopt the technologies that could be developed here. Well, abs absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. anything we can do here in that area is going to help Bakersfield and is going to put us on the map. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Vice Mayor. And colleagues, just in the interest of time, is there anybody who uh, would oppose that? Uh, maybe this would be the opportunity then to speak out so everybody doesn't have to comment. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dale. I really appreciate you uh, what you've shared. And I want to support uh, what my colleagues have said. And you know, particularly what M Vice Mayor keeps pushing in terms of we've got to look into the future, right? Like way, way ahead to be really prepared for that. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Motion to receive and file. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you. And Vice Mayor? Motion to adjourn to closed session. So uh, we are adjourned to closed session at 527. Uh, members of the public, we will be going in, I'm going to say, for a minimum of 15 minutes. We're really sorry. This meeting did run long, but uh, we will need to take care of what's on the agenda in closed session, and then we will be back out again. So thank you very much. Reconvening the 3.30 City Council meeting, Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor. On item 4A, there is no reportable action. Thank you. And with that, we stand adjourned at 6.04.